Hello, my name is Denise Luneman, and I'm one of the members here at Desert Grace. I'm excited to share this Sunday message with you. Would you take a moment right now to subscribe to our channel? And if you like this video, be sure to give us a thumbs up so that we know you've been blessed. You can do those things below. A body of water can be an effective boundary limiting access for people or for animals. And, and basically it comes down to this. Hey, you can do a lot of things, but you may not feel comfortable going through the water. You may not be able to go on top of the water. You may not know how deep the water is. It doesn't even have to be a lot of water. It just needs to be a little bit. But I was trying to think of, of exactly what I'm trying to refer to in this. And one thing came to mind, and that is a moat. Now, you might have immediately thought a castle, and of course, I'll talk about that in a minute. But the moat that I'm most used to seeing in real life is the kind of moat you will find at a zoo. The kind where, where they have maybe put a little bit of water between where the animals are and where you are so that they don't have quite as tall of a, of a wall. Now, this was rather fun to research, right? Because in the midst of researching this, there are all kinds of absolutely wonderful videos of animals falling into their moats. You know, like a, 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 there was one of a lion that was, that, that was just really kind of strutting and looking over at the people, almost maybe a little menacing, you see kind of from the backside, but kind of like they're kind of checking out what's going on on the other side of the moat, and he takes a misstep and ends in the water, which was fun to watch. I don't know why, it just was. <laughs> But I'm sure if you wanted to be an expert in this, there are so many articles that I ran across. I didn't read them because I really don't care that much. I just understand that a moat doesn't have to have water in it, which is kind of an interesting thought. And in fact, even the ones with the castles, the original moats didn't have water in them. Now, when I think of them, they have not only some water, but some mean snapping alligators that are always hungry. You know, so that if anybody tries to do anything, to try to, to storm the castle, you must first get over the, the, the alligator. And if you're really good, you can stand on their mouths and get across as they're trying to eat you. But when you think about it, if you have to stop and figure out how to get through 10 feet of water that may or may not be kind of deep, it's going to slow you down. And when it slows you down, the guy that's up on the top of the castle has plenty of time to throw something at you or shoot you or whatever he's going to do. And so it makes a lot of sense. So a moat, just a mere matter, a mere presence of water is enough to keep lions and tigers and bears away and to keep the, the castle safe. Alcatraz, of course, was considered an ideal prison because in order to escape, you had to make it out of the prison and then into the water and somehow to the other side. And that was not easy water to swim in and all that kind of stuff, so it was considered the, the secure prison. You're not going to be escaping. And, and what is the one thing people are remembered for having stayed in Alcatraz? It's the escape attempts. If you've ever gone over there, that's what the, the, the most fun of it is. You know, forget, oh, look, it's an old building. Oh, look, it's an old cell. Some of the, the characters, and I use that term, characters that were in there, but then the, uh, the escape attempts are, are always very interesting. The boundaries of natural water were often barriers for Israel during the Exodus. Think of the Jordan River as one of them. Because when you get to a point, especially if you're traveling with a huge group of people, I don't know if you've ever been with a large group of people and needed to try to figure out if, what you're going to do to get somewhere. But even like my family, if it wasn't for the fact that I get to take dad rule and say, we're going where I want to go, if we tried to come to a consensus how to get somewhere, we'd never, we'd never arrive. That's all I'm going to say about that. But if we had to swim across a lake or swim across a river, could you imagine that there's going to be somebody in this room who looks and goes, that water is moving too fast. I am surely going to die. I'll stay here. Thank you very much. No, no, we need you on the other side. Nope, I'm going to die. No, we'll make sure you're all right. Nope, there'll be others of us, and this might be me, who take our first step in and go, ooh, ooh, that's very cold. I'm a desert guy, and I'm used to heat. 
that's a little bit cold. Um, let's warm it up a little bit, and then I'll be ready to go across. Anyway, so the boundaries of natural water end up being boundaries for that. And by the way, we see this over and over and over again in the story of the Exodus. One of the obvious ones where water is a boundary is the Red Sea. But then what happens? God removes the boundary. And they walk through on dry land, and then the Egyptians that followed them in, God says, well, good luck, and takes care of them. So you first have, have that. There's also this incredible dependence on God when water was scarce. And when you start to think about it, that becomes a barrier, and it really does for Israel. In part because Israel begins to become so concerned about their health, about their safety, about their, where their next drink is going to come from, that they begin to struggle with that very matter itself and, and begin to pretty much walk away from God. What did you bring us out here for? Just to die? So we get to the Jordan River. And so that we're all on the same page. It's like, here we are. And look at right there, probably the distance to the other building from over here, there is the promised land. If only we will cross the water. If only we will cross the water, there's Jericho, and we will be in the promised land. Woohoo! You should be getting really excited at this point. We've been going through Joshua. Joshua 1 starts off by showing how Joshua becomes the leader. He takes over from Moses. God is behind all of that. That's how that whole thing gets started. And that's what we talked about in the very first chapter. Last week, we did Joshua chapter 2, and it shows how God uses imperfect people, a, 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 a prostitute, and some bumbling spies to bring encouragement to the entire nation and to kind of give them the idea that God is still there, that God is in control, and that if they had any wonders about whether God could or couldn't do what God wants to do, there's no reason to wonder at all, because look it, they are melting in fear. They're melting, melting. Right? So finally, chapter 3. I've been promising you this since we started. Do you remember? We finally get to go across the river. Everybody at home just shouted really loud. I know they did. The neighbors are starting to go, maybe I should go find out what's going on over there. Maybe I should see. My question for us this morning is how do we discover how to cross over for ourselves into our own spiritual promised land? You see, the temptation for us here is to begin to look at this story as merely a history story, as merely a moment in the life of Israel as opposed to this serious spiritual truth that you and I can just see today. And we must be careful that when we come to a passage like this, that we aren't stopping here and going, okay. Know this one. Turn some pages. I could, I, could, I could tell this story right and left. I know exactly what happened. And that's the concern. I want you to remember, this is a rescue story that has lasted for 40 years. Several Bible books. You remember? The Bible starts with Genesis, and really that's when the promise is given to Abraham. But then Exodus begins with the rescue from Egypt after they had been slaves there and being oppressed for so long. And then you have all these books in the middle hey, that finally we get to Joshua and 40 years has passed. A generation has died out. Moses is dead and now Joshua is being made leader. And we are excited to see what God's going to do to give Israel the promised land that he assured them so long ago. So, sit on the edge of your seat, get ready for the passage, it's good, it's rich. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people, 
When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. Now, if you're not really paying close attention because we're reading the story, this is the part where Joshua finally says, Onward we go! So they took it up and they went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe, and as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. I love that image of a heap of water. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvest, yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan. While the water was flowing down to the Sea of Abara, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite of Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan, and they stood on dry ground, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. <sighs> That's cool, right? I mean, you kind of want to be there. You kind of want to see it. And then I don't know about you, but there's a little part of me that as I read the story, I get to the end, and it sort of ends with, well, then everybody crossed over. And by the way, this is just an ad for next week's program, right? We'll do chapter four, and you get to find out what happens next. So stay tuned. We're going to work through this today. Next week, we'll get to go do the next part. But part of me is like, 40 years this has been in the making. 40 years. And what I truly would have expected to see is the miracle, which I got to see. That was kind of cool, right? But I'm pretty confident that the way Joshua seems to have been presented and the way the Israelites seem to be obeying that at this time, there should have been a lot of guys with like trumpets or horns and maybe a marching band of Israelites and, and some floats as we're going across because God is doing something incredible. Like, like this is a parade. And what you get is, well, they kind of broke up camp, packed up their stuff, went across the, the Jordan with the miracle, and of course, then you can't find out what happens because the chapter ended. Don't read ahead. <laughs> At least not while I'm preaching. All right? I want you to remember, I've been telling you this for three weeks, Joshua is more concerned about theology than he is with history. So if you noticed that while we were reading this passage, or if you're reading it at any given time, you're going to see that it's sort of choppy. It has overlapping facts, like it repeats some things that are kind of important to repeat. And the details that are chosen, I will tell you that so many times I have more questions after the fact than I did before I started. 
because we're there, guys with horns. What, what, what did the children think? How many people stopped and looked to see, could you see this water in a heap? How many people tripped going across? Because there's stones in the riverbed, in case you didn't know, that that's just reality. Were there any fish on the ground? If you've been eating manna all this time, I'm thinking that if there were any fish on the ground, you might be tempted to stop and have a snack. I got a lot of questions, but, but the details that are chosen aren't about a history as much as it's about, look at how God works. Look at what God did. So I want to kind of pull out some of those facts in this story. First off, I want to make sure we absolutely get this clear. Joshua is the leader of the nation. Yahweh is providing direction, but Joshua is the, the, the main captain, the, the representative, just as Moses had been. We can't miss this fact. It's incredibly important to us because if we miss this fact, we are missing part of the theology of the book, that God chooses the leaders, that God chooses who God will choose, that God will prepare those people. And so it's throughout this whole thing, starting with verse 1, where Joshua and all the Israelites set out for Jordan to camp before crossing over. Uh, and pay close attention to crossing over or cross over or crossing the river. It's going to appear about 22 times in this chapter and a couple verses after. It's an incredible saying. It's an incredible thing to think about. So first thing we're told is that Joshua gets up and takes all of Israel with him is essentially how that is. Then you have the officers carrying out orders. Those orders came from... And if you remember in chapter 1, when Joshua said, okay, Lord, whatever, he went out and he told everybody, hey, he told his officers, hey, go and tell everybody how many days till we leave? Three. How many days passed when they're giving the orders? It's time. It's time. Three. So Joshua is the leader with God at the head, but they are listening to Joshua. They're paying close attention to him. Joshua then tells the people, you need to consecrate yourselves. You need to consecrate yourself and be ready for what is going to happen tomorrow. When we cross over into the river, or cross over the river and get to the other side. Now, the Bible actually doesn't tell us that he told them to consecrate themselves, and so they did. But we can assume, we can presume certainly, that if Joshua gave the order and all of these people are following Joshua's orders, that they did what they were told. Interesting thought there. Just throw that out there. By verse 7, Yahweh is affirming Joshua's leadership. He's saying, you are the one that I've chosen, and watch as I exalt you before all of the other Israelites. Pay attention. See what you're doing. And the people obey Joshua and, by the way, Yahweh, and they cross over as part of a miraculous event. Some of this, well, most of this, is fulfillment of promises. So Joshua being the leader in itself shows us how God fulfills promises because when you think about it, God has taken care of him. He's, he's made lots of promises. The Ark of the Covenant shows up, and it kind of shows up, I think, a little bit out of nowhere, but it tries to keep the focus on the divine. That there's a, an, an instrument of God's choosing. And in this particular case, it happens to be the Ark of the Covenant. You might remember Moses' staff being part of that, or, or you must hold your arms up, or whatever, that, that God gives the, these sorts of things. But the focus should never be on the person who has to, to bang on the rock or whatever, but should be on God. should never be on the tool, but it should be on God. Now, I want you to remember what the Ark was all about. There was no ark, but then there became one way back in the midst of the wilderness. And God needed a place to dwell. There needed to be a place for people to worship. 
And as part of that, there became this tabernacle, and part of the tabernacle became this ark and this important piece of Israel's history that, that has been the lore, right, of, of we need to find this thing. Where is it? What's it doing? The, the ark was used by Moses to meet with God. It was a literal physical representation of God himself. So that when Moses went in and spoke to God to the very mercy seat, as it was called, that he was speaking to God as though face to face, like you and I, even if we're doing it via video, are doing. That's what it was all about. Ultimately, the ark was placed in the holiest place of the tabernacle or the temple. And then Aaron could only go in once a year. The highest priest gets one chance a year to be a part of that. When you begin to think about how important this piece of history is to Israel as part of God's very presence, seeing it would certainly remind you that God is in control and that God is with you. I want to point out that in Numbers 10, the ark becomes a symbol of God's presence in a journey or in a war. So the idea is that from that point forward, when the ark moves and Moses moves, then the people will also move with it, and it will be this physical representation of God as the leader. It's really cool. And so if God is the leader as you're making your journey, can you pretty much count on being safe? And if God is the leader, if he's the first thing you're taking with you as you go out to war, do you think you might win if you have the God of the universe with you? And so this is an important aspect. But even though this is brought up in Numbers 10, the only time it's ever mentioned again, it's a negative thing. Numbers 14, 44 talks about how the people left without Moses and the ark and tried to go somewhere else. So we've never seen it actually carried out this way until now. Isn't that awesome? I know you already knew this. I'm kind of boring you now. I'm sorry. So since that designation is given in Numbers 10, here is the first time we actually see it carried out. I also want to remind you that the ark represents Israel's relationship with God. I don't know what we would do, but we, we have things like photographs. Um, we have things like uh, uh, maybe a possession that somebody has given us or a gift. Uh, I'm thinking if somebody were to, to graduate onto heaven, how we, what would we have that represents our relationship with them? And probably a photograph or, or, or an item. And I have some items that belong to my grandparents that, that remind me of the relationship and, and the connection that I had to them. Well, this is God's relationship with Israel. And within the Ark of the Covenant, you might remember that the ten tablets, or the tablets with the ten commandments, not ten of them, two of them, are in there. And then Aaron's staff had been placed in there. And then a jar of what is it? Manna. So this sort of describes like a, it's almost like a, a time capsule, a, a memory, a, 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 a moment of time to recall what God is doing in the life of Israel up to that point. The arc about this story is only about Joshua as the leader. He's the one that says, God says we're ready. It's time to go. And about God as the one who is actually doing the actions. We need to make sure we have this clear. And it's important to me that we understand this because I think sometimes we forget we forget that the ark as a symbol, the, the reason it appears in the story isn't to show that if only we had an ark, we would be unbeatable. Or that God would do whatever we wanted him to do. Joshua is leading as God has, has promised to act. So that if I had the ark today, I found it, and I brought it here, and said, this is the ark of the covenant and when we leave, we will all be filthy rich because I want to be, and God wants us to be too, I'm sure. 
If that were what we were saying, we would have missed the point of this altogether. You see, when we start to think of the ark as that, we make the ark into sort of a magic wand, sort of like a, a, you know, abracadabra. We get what we want. And if we do that, we then make God into a magic wand. We need to be careful about this, right? We need to be really careful. Israel is instructed to prepare for the crossing event as they would for worship. God is leading it. God is going to be present. God is going to be doing something incredible. It's as though what what Joshua has said is simply this. You need to get ready because God is going to be there. He's showing up tomorrow. And you need to be present I think if Joshua were were there today and he was instructing us and he was saying, look, we are about to go into the promised land. I I need you to be ready. I think one of the things he would probably say to us as a church and to the Big C Church altogether is he would probably tell us, you need to wake up. We are so distracted by everything that's going on around us that God is going to be present. God is going to do something incredible. And if you are so busy with your face in your phone or or wherever else it might be, you are going to miss what God will do. So that's essentially what he's saying. Consecrate yourself. Get ready. Consecrating yourself was a process to ensure readiness to be in God's presence. In some respects, it was as simple as, hey, take a shower. Like, we've kind of gotten really relaxed about how we dress in church, but why did people used to wear suits and ties and fancy Sunday dresses? You were going to go meet with people and worship God. You don't want to just wake up with a hangover and come in with whatever dirty clothes you got on. You got to be ready. Now, we've come to a little different understanding with God that God does accept us who we are. We don't need to dress fancy. God knows where all of our warts are. Come on. But we ought to be ready when we walk in and know that God is going to do something great. One of my biggest frustrations sometimes is people come to church and they're more excited about seeing their friends and seeing what God will do today. Of course, not right now. No one's coming, but that's a whole other story. Israel is instructed to follow the ark, but also to remain a safe distance from it. There's a couple of different reasons why maybe this could be. One of them being quite simply that there's this sort of distance that the warriors would keep from a king. So it sort of sets up the ark as being the king. You need to stay far enough away from the king as to be respectful. But let me tell you something. Joshua never tells them why. Did you catch it in the scripture? He says, stay away from it. Follow it, but don't get too close. Sort of like a fire truck. If you're going to follow it, 500 feet or whatever. There's something about that. That God wants to be special, that he wants to be revered, and we should be paying close attention. Scholars point out in all the commentaries that this purification is not just merely a cultic worship purification, but also in preparation for war. You may meet God this day. Wouldn't you want to be ready? That's part of the thing. One of the great, amazing aspects of this is it's one of the first times we see Yahweh identified as the living God. You remember how that came about, right? We were reading the passage, and unfortunately, sometimes when I'm reading the passage, I get really excited, and I forget to stop and go, look at that, that's really cool. Well, I I don't forget as much as I'm like, hey, you guys are like watching your clock already, right? Joshua tells them there's going to be no question but that God is going to be with them. God is going to do something great in their presence. In fact, he names seven nations that they are going to drive out of the land so that they can enter it. And if you were a biblical scholar, you would be trying to identify the nations. And some of the nations, they have an idea of where they were, or the people groups. And some of them are listed in other parts of the Bible. Some of them are listed in other literature of that time. You have all these different things. But there's something about the number. 
But number seven, which in the Bible is always perfection. It's always completion, that God will see this through, that it's going to be complete. He, he even lets out the, the secret, right? So if, if you were one of the people that were like, I'm worried that the water's going to be really cold, or I'm worried that I'm not going to be able to swim if the current is too fast, he says, look, when we get down to the edge, God's going to stop the water. We're going to walk right over Ooh, this is awesome. And then just for good measure, by the way, the Jordan is in the flood stage, M meaning that all the snow is melting and the water is flowing and it's nice and wide. If this had been a different time of the year, uh, perhaps it would have been just a low river. But God never seems to like be content unless he is the one doing the work show that he is the one behind it. One of the things that is so incredibly important for us to get is that God's presence is the key indicator to the success. There's nothing to be fearful of. And that's essentially what Joshua says. He says, whatever you're worried about, knock it off. Because quite simply, God's got it. He's got it. Now, we get to the end of the chapter, right? And all of the dialogue begins to fade away. There's no more discussion. There's no more speeches. There's no more God talking. The miracle unfolds. The entire nation crosses over. And as we've already mentioned, and then the, the, the story just abruptly ends. Stay tuned. Come back next week. Same channel. Same station. Again, to me, this almost feels a little anticlimactic. Hey, come on. Now, I realize we don't get to see exactly what happens when they get on the other side, but if you've read ahead, you know. But there ought to at least be a potluck. Yep. Even if it is, what is it? Yep. You bring your what is it, I'll bring my what is it, we'll have a potluck. There should be some balloons. There should be some singing and worship. Joshua ought to get up and preach the, the best sermon of his life. Anyway, it's a miracle. We can't forget that this is a miracle. We got to let our imagination see the water sort of heaping up. We got to see them walking across. We got to remember, and there are some people in the room this morning, and probably a bunch on the, uh, on the video, that you aren't even old enough to know what 40 years feels like. Forty years in the making. This is a miracle. What was once the boundary, it was the stopping point, it was what kept them from getting there becomes the gateway to the brand new land that had been promised to them as a gift by God himself. Amen. Oh, this is good stuff. How do we discover how to cross over for ourselves to our own spiritual promised land? I, I want to make sure you understand that God has given you some promises. He, he has a goal for you. And, and one of the problems that I think some of us are feeling in today's day and age is that if you haven't noticed, we are in a bit of a wilderness right now. Not knowing is the worst part of being in the wilderness. And Israel would have been in that wilderness for 40 years until all of a sudden one day Moses is gone and Joshua becomes the, the new leader. And, and he comes out and says, God says three days. It's going to be a little bit like when they finally say, hey, in three days, you can go back out. It'll be completely safe again. Some of you don't seem to be getting this, but all right. The first thing I would say is that we discover how to cross over when we listen to God's voice in the wilderness. If we are in the wilderness right now, 
And I think there's lots of opportunity or lots of possibilities here. One is that sometimes we are in the wilderness as a community like we feel like we are right now. But there's also a personal wilderness where God sometimes feels so far away and like he is taking forever to act. And if we are in the midst of a wilderness like that, one of the things we must learn to do is to listen to God's voice. And I've happened to notice that God normally speaks in low tones. Occasionally, maybe God shouts at me, but I don't think it's very often. Normally, you've got to listen really carefully to what God has to say. You see, there's nothing more important than being in tune with what God is saying to you or what God wants to say with you, to know what God wants for you. There's nothing more important in your life right now than God being right there and with you every step of the way, speaking to you, guiding you, comforting you, directing you. That is what you ought to be listening for. And there's nothing more important than that. But to hear him... You've got to spend some time with him. My fear is that sometimes we actually know that God is tapping us on the shoulder, and guess what we do? Uh, Excuse me, I'm busy. And he taps us again. Oh, yes, 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 you wanted to speak. Um, Okay, I got a minute. He says, I need more than that, let me know. How do you spend more time with God? Read your Bible. Three, four hours a day could be enough. Three, four minutes a day could be enough. Sort of depends on how close you want to be to Him. You should pray. Praying is when you talk to God, and you also should listen back to see what He has to say. Uh, If you start to think, I don't have time for prayer, there's something wrong with your life. Because there isn't one set time. It's not like church. I don't have time for church today. It's throughout the day. I don't have one opportunity a day where I can call my wife and say, hey, how's work today? But when I think about it, I may pick up the phone and call. Do you do that with God? And then I put silence in there. We are not good at silence. You see what just happened there, right? Sudden discomfort. Oh, he just quit talking. Did he forget what he was going to say? No. That's proven a point. We aren't comfortable with being silent. If I were to be silent long enough, all of you would pull out a phone or a book or whatever, or you would just go, I guess church is over, let's leave. I wouldn't stop talking that long. Practice some silence in your life. That's probably the hardest thing of the three things on this list, is to just let God speak and not do anything during those moments. I admit I have a problem with this one, but I try. Joshua had to be ready to hear Yahweh's voice, or he would never have heard it. But he also had to be willing to be open to what God was calling him to do. Uh, Imagine if Joshua had answered like Moses. But Joshua heard, you are the one I've chosen. And Joshua says, okay, Lord, we will do this. I will be your agent. And I've said this before, I'll say it again. God has a call for everybody. He has a call for you in the good times. He has a call for you in the wilderness times. His call for you may be one overarching call, but by the way, he's going to tap you on the shoulder, and like the video that we showed earlier, he may have something special for you. Pay attention. Listen. Have you already heard God's voice in this season? Have you paid attention to what he wants you to do today? 
when you have, you'll know when to cross over because he'll tell you. He'll tell you. Second thing I would say is that we discover how to cross over as we prepare ourselves for the task. Israel had to do several different sorts of preparations. They had to, you know, move closer to the Jordan. They had to camp there. They had to get ready. They did the whole thing with, with the purification. It seems like it's such a short time. But all of these things happen. And I wanted to kind of point this out real quickly because sometimes when we feel like God is giving us a task, we feel so woefully unprepared. And when you think, all right, three days to get ready to go into the promised land, it seems like this incredibly tight schedule. Um, but God had been working on them for 40 years. And again, some of you aren't even 40 years old yet, but God may have been working in your life for your entire life to lead you to this moment to prepare you for this task that he wants you to do. Just like he would have been doing for Israel. <laughs> Once they agreed to it, once they were prepared, the last thing to do was to be ready to be in the presence of the divine activity of the living God. If you don't see God at work around you, you're not paying attention. He is still active. He is still living. And he wants you to be a part of it. Whatever task as, as God has for you, he's been preparing you for it. He, he's got you ready if you will just do what he wants you to do. But have you prepared yourself to be part of God's active, activity in the world? Have you done it? Are you ready? I don't want you to miss out on the privilege of what God has for you to do. Hey, that's important. Let's don't do that. And finally, we discover how to cross over as we learn to focus on God's presence in the moment. If you really want to look back at Israel, God was present for 40 years. If you were an Israelite, you might look back and you might go, well, now, was God really present on this day? Or was God really present on that day? Or was God really leading us here? Or was God really leading us there? Or was God really trying to do this something? Why wasn't God more, you know, like even when Moses goes up to get the Ten Commandments and they're like, oh, God has eaten him or something. He hasn't sent him back. But God was present every single moment of every single day, physically present. And I think it's for us as well. For Israel, following the Ark of the Covenant was that physical representation of following God right into the promised land. Whew, there you go. How do you keep your focus where it belongs? What keeps your eyes on God? Hmm. I think part of our problem is it's so easy for us to get so caught up in all the details. Everything I need to do, everything that's not going right, everything that is a challenge that's laid out in front of us, that we simply forget to make it the priority that, you know what? Which is bigger, whatever problem you're looking at, or God? Easy, right? Duh. Hmm. Focus on God alone. I say this as much to all of you as I do to myself, or much to myself as I do to all of you this morning. It's so easy to get caught up. What are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to be thinking? What are we supposed to be watching? What are we supposed to be listening to? What kinds of actions should we be taking or not taking? No, we should be looking at God and doing what God wants us to do. So this morning, is there a boundary that God wants you to cross over? Is there something like a Jordan River in your life that, that you just haven't stepped over to, to give God what God is promising you, to let him give you what he wants? Is there something that keeps you from getting your own personal promised land that, that God has promised you something better than what you have today? And I'm not talking about a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm talking about that presence that we so long desire from him. Because if there's a boundary 
that God wants you to cross over, and there's something keeping you from giving in to him, today's the day to give that up. God has it. Listen to what he's calling you to do. Prepare yourself for what's about to happen and focus on God. And guess what? All is better. All is better. Are you ready to cross over? I am. Don't be asking, well, what's it going to look like? It's going to look like God is present with you. What does that look like? Well, God knows. Who are you looking at? God. Don't look at all the other junk. Heavenly Father, it seems like we have been in the wilderness for a while with the current pandemic. We're hoping that this isn't a 40-year process. We're being told it's a couple-year process, but Lord, we're ready. Help us to keep our focus on you. Help us to be able to listen to you, to not neglect our relationship with you, to not walk away from what we know to be right, but let us simply be basking in your presence. Lord, if there's anybody here this morning who says, I'm having a really hard time hearing God's voice, will you speak a little louder? Open their hearts, open their minds, clear their focus. If you're calling them to do something today, whether that just be simply making a decision to follow you, for the very first time, or whether it's something much more deeper, may this be the moment that they get to cross over into their own promised land. They get to have the very God, the creator of the universe, present in everything that they do. Lord, help us to keep in mind that that sometimes we must prepare ourselves by noticing what you have done already in our lives. Help us to remember this story as one that allows us the very privilege of getting closer to you. Lord, this morning, once again, we love you. We worship you alone. We thank you for who you are and what you've done, not just for Israel, but for all of us. We look forward to what you're going to do in our lives in the near future. Lord, guide us, direct us, keep us safe until we have the opportunity to worship together once again. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. Thanks for watching this sermon with me. If you enjoyed your time with us, we'd invite you to join us in person for a service. Visit us at desertgrace.org or give us a call at 928-305-1132 for more information.